environment impact assessment part 6. So, if you recall in previous lecture, we just discussed about the EIA process in great detail. So, continuing with that, we will now discuss each of these process that are mentioned here little bit in detail for your benefit so that you understand the EIA procedure in a much better manner. Now, screening after the project proposals are submitted, we said that it will go for screening. The screening process actually determines whether a particular project requires a preparation of EIA or not, because we know that no that category A, B, C different type of category we will screen and accordingly we will see that whether we need to go for EIA or not. The threshold requirements for an EIA varies from country to country. Now, we all know that uh, if you look at say suppose uh, water pollution parameter, the maximum permissible limit for certain parameters in India and same those parameters, the maximum permissible limit in some other countries, developed countries, you will find that there is a significant difference. Now, country wise the threshold limit will be different, some laws and regulations also will be little different. So, EIA for any project that may have a significant impact on our environment or for projects that exceed a certain monetary value or say impact on a particular aspect that will require EIA. In some cases particularly if the possible impacts of a project are not clearly known to us, we are not able to suppose, suppose the committee of the experts of EIA not able to exactly identify that for this project these, these will be the negative impacts. What to do? At that point of time, if not EIA, but a preliminary assessment will be prepared to determine whether that project requires an EIA or not. So, that means what is the message? Message is that blindly we are not telling that everything has to go for EIA. Before you say that one project needs EIA, there also has, is a process that we need to follow. Now, various development banks like I mentioned about ADB, African Development Bank, list of 8, 9, 10 banks that I have given, they also screen projects according to their different you know procedure, established procedure, which are presented you know for financing to decide whether the EIA is required using their set criteria or not. Now, bank to bank also it might different, World Bank may have some criteria, African Development Bank, JB may have different criteria that we need to know. In most of the cases, these are all very clearly defined, these days you can get it in their website itself. The output of the screening process is often a document which is known as Initial Environmental Examination IEE as we discussed in the previous lecture or the initial environmental evaluation, initial environmental examination or initial environmental evaluation. So, the conclusion of this screening exercise will be a classification of the project according to its likely environmental sensitivity and that will determine whether an EIA is needed or not. So, that categorization that we discussed in the previous lecture category A, B, C with World Bank example, remember? So, that is what will be done. In scoping, scoping exercise, it is generally used to identify the key issues or the concern of an project, proposed project, its implementation planning processes. The results of this scoping study will determine the scope, the depth and the TO or terms of reference to be addressed within the environmental domain or environmental statement, clear? Now, how this scoping is done? Scoping is done through identifying the concerns and the issues for consideration of an EIA. We ensure a re relevant EIA. It is also enable those responsible for the EIA study to properly brief the study team on the alternatives and also the impacts that to be considered at different level of analysis. Scoping also helps in determining the assessment methods that actually needs to be used 
under EIA. Scoping also helps in identifying all affected interests, means for one project which are the different kind of effects on the environment, it will list out that. It also helps providing an opportunity for public involvement in determining the factors that to be assessed and also it will facilitate an early agreement on you know different contentious issues. And of course, if you do all those things certainly it will save your time and money. And at the end of a day through scoping study you will be able to establish a TOR for EIA study, clear? What are the tools we can use under scoping study? Checklists which will have you know a list of queries, questions which are on the different project and its different impact and they could be very generic in nature and at some time also could be specific. Matrices, this helps in interactions or helps in identifying the interactions between various project and environment parameters or component. Suppose again and water state development structure you are developing for what? Managing water, but that structure itself whether would have any impact on the local society, local environment, you know agriculture etc, etc. These things also need to be checked, matrices help in that. Networking or networks, networks actually they cause, they actually look at the effect flow uh, mechanism which is used to help in tracing out the relationship that exist between different activities associated with the action and environmental system with which those you know parameters interact. Consultations, consultations with various stakeholders, decision makers, developers, communities, various environment groups, okay. So, consultation can be carried out, but there is also you know one danger that in this process if you go for excessive consultations and try to make everyone happy because you know whenever there is a project, say the example of Normada project, you remember how much had been written in media and everywhere, just search in Google you will find it out. So, the thing is that consultation is important, but sometime too much of consultation also could be you know detrimental uh, for various uh, reasons, okay. So, that also we need to keep in mind. Many of you who are into professions and taking this particular MOOC course, you may be aware about the term TOR. Often we use terms of reference for any kind of project that we uh, start working with. So, TOR, once a project or development project you know has gone through a screening or scoping uh, study process, the authorities which are responsible for processing the EIA would provide the client or the proposer with a terms of reference document. Suppose if I am the owner of a company and I am proposing to establish an factory or industry in an area, then after all this screening and scoping study, I will be given a TOR by the government. The TOR will provide the details of all the information required for the EIA review committee to take to make an informed decision about whether to award the environment uh, approval or not. TOR varies again from country to country, project to project. Now, in TOR or terms of reference, what are the aspects that must be there? That is important for us to know. It should actually be able to talk about whether a range of proposals should be considered and if so, whether they would be less environmentally damaging. The TOR whether the main environmental impacts of the proposed project both in the project area and in the surrounding area and the time scale of impacts also need to be looked at. The size and the extent of the impact based as much as possible on quantitative data, not just assumption looking at the project proposal. Qualitative assessment in such kind of cases is not actually acceptable. In most of the cases you will find that it may be preferable not to mention any specific topic or make the consultant responsible for a complete review of all topics. Those groups that will actually benefit and those which actually will be affected negatively by the project also need to be discussed with 
and considered. The impact of any kind of rare species of plant or animal in a, that particular area need to be looked at. Impact on human health, the control and management aspect of the project to determine whether they will be effective or not. The need for further baseline data collection. Suppose you have collected, but then you feel that whether there is a requirement of further data collections or other you know specific studies is required. That also in TOR, the people, the consultants who are be involved, they need to look at. The present policy, institutional or legislative situation, future requirements, these also need to be thought while preparing the TOR. Mitigating measures needed for that particular development project and how they should be incorporated into the overall project design also need to be looked at and should be mentioned in the TOR. The monitoring and evaluation activities of that project which are required to ensure that mitigating measures which have been proposed are implemented and future any kind of impact negative impact of problems are avoided. So, you see that how important a TOR, a TOR, a project outcome will be as good as its TOR is many times experts say like that. Now, if you look at the TOR for environmental impact assessment of an irrigation and drainage project as an example, because this is one example which uh, I think most of you will be able to understand. The TOR should actually start with a brief description of the project. Suppose your project is as I said in irrigation or drainage project. First you start with a brief description of the project that actually should have a plan of the areas where you are actually going to implement the project and then some basic data should be given on the existing and also on the proposed irrigation and drainage planning. That TOR also should include the catchment characteristics because any irrigation or drainage project that you will develop largely depends on the catchment areas and the characteristics of a catchment area. The institutions which are involved in the proposal should also be given some kind of importance and they should be also discussed while developing a TOR for irrigation and drainage project. An overview of the local government where actually the project is taking place and that overview should include the socio-economic information, land use, land tenure, water use of the area and any other particular aspect associated with flora fauna means plants and organisms. If other studies which have been completed, a list of all those available reports also should be there given a mention there, previous studies. Okay. A brief description should be given on the most important institutions which are there in that particular locations which you are proposing your project, including those which are responsible for the EIA, the project executing agency the future managers. So, these all should be presented in the form of a organogram. So, that anyone look at this and can clearly understand who are the people and at what capacity they are involved with. A description of the work to be undertaken should give a general set of requirements for determining the potential impact of certain activities and the potential impacts on what means whether specific plant or organisms. So, overall the TOR should give an indication of the team which you consider necessary for the study. Depending on the scope of the study, this may also include one or several of the following other aspect like a irrigation specialist, a drainage specialist in the team, rural sociologist, terrestrial ecologist aquatic ecologist or a fishery expert. See, these are all on the basis of your project. Okay? That is why these experts are coming. If you go for a industry, so a food processing industry or some other industry, then you need the other kind of expertise. Okay? So, this is a project of irrigation. That is why you are going for drainage specialist, rural sociologist, aquatic ecologist, fisheries expert, hydrologist, agronomist, all these kind of experts. Okay? So, that is one kind of TOR for a project like irrigation or drainage project. So, before you start actually 
work on a project by a group of consultant or by a group of you know experts they need a tor terms of reference on what they will be doing and that's why i'm telling that developing a very good tor is the first most important step for a project to become successful so next is a baseline data collection baseline data collection is another important aspect of this exercise and in this case when we say baseline data collection it is meant that a collection of background information on the biophysical social economic settings of the proposed project area information need to be obtained from secondary sources or the acquisition of you know new information either through field sampling interviews surveys or even consultation with the you know public or stakeholders the task of collecting baseline data starts right from the period of project inception and a majority of this particular task baseline data collection should be undertaken during scoping and also actual eia now baseline data is collected for two main purposes what are those first to provide a description of the current status and trends of environmental factors as for example air pollutant concentration of an area so the trends of environmental factors of the area where the project will come against which predicted changes can be compared and evaluated in terms of the significance so provide a description of the current status and trends of environmental factors of the host area means where your project will take place okay against the predicted change that can happen if the project takes place that can be compared in the basis of the description that also come under baseline data collection next to provide a means of detecting actual change by monitoring once the project has been initiated baseline data needed to assess the prediction of the impact content in the terms of reference and scoping report must be collected so these are the two main purposes that why we go for baseline data collection all right next impact analysis and prediction by now we all know that eia the predictions on the early warning is how much critical for a project to be implemented or not to be implemented it is the core parameter of eia process the impact analysis and prediction predicting the intensity or magnitude of a development and the associated likely impacts and evaluating their significance is based on the available environmental baseline of the project area these predictions and impact analysis are described in quantitative or qualitative terms now let us see the consideration for impact prediction what are the points that you will consider for prediction of impact of a particular project first magnitude of impact how much how much the project if takes place can actually impact local area and environment this is defined by the severity of each potential impact and indicates whether the impact is irreversible or reversible and estimate potential rate of recovery so reversible or irreversible if it is irreversible permanent damage that has to be you know understood you cannot allow certain project to takes place if you know through the ai analysis that it is going to have a irreversible damage second point is extent of impact the special extent or the area how much the impact of a particular project will be there must be determined an impact can be site specific or limited to a project area it could be local impact it could be trans boundary impact it could be even international impact there are several examples you know that you can think of where one project taking place in one country but affecting the other country or countries there are many example duration of impact environmental impact have temporal dimension and it needs to be considered in an eia 
an impact that generally lasts for only 3 to 9 years after the project completion may be classified as a short term one and an impact which continues for 10 to 20 years may be defined as medium term and that last beyond 20 years are considered as long term very clear short term medium term long term so any project between 3 to 9 years are short term 3 to 9 years short term 10 to 20 years medium term and greater than 20 years is long term clear now next is the significance of the impact under impact analysis and this refers to the value or amount of the impact once an impact has been predicted its significance must be evaluated using an appropriate choice of criterion you remember we in earlier lectures we have discussed about criteria right the most important forms of criterion are specific legal requirements as for example national law standard international agreement conventions relevant policies etc then public views and complaints suppose one project has started somehow and eia was not carried out properly once the project started then people found that there is some issue some problem and they complained and then what happened is that they submitted the complaint and then exercise has been initiated next is threat to sensitive ecosystem resources as for example which can lead to extinction of various species depletion of various resources and sometimes this can also lead to conflict there are many examples between two countries regarding one resources suppose a fertile piece of land right now i call record one example of dafur there was you know lot of conflict with piece of fertile land two countries almost fought with each other lot of tension with piece of land a resource geographical extent of the impact which has transboundary implications cost of mitigation cumulative impacts as for example suppose you add more impacts to the existing ones and then you on top of that you add some more duration time period over which this impact will actually occur and also the probability of occurrence very likely unlikely likely like that reversibility of impact very important whether there is a chance of you know natural recovery of a damage caused by a particular project or with the help of human intervention some restoration preservation work number number of people likely to be affected and their locations is another important considerations or criteria uncertainty in prediction due to you know lack of accurate data or complex systems in this case precautionary principle is often advocated to use for this criteria selection technique for impact analysis and prediction next impact prediction methodologies to study what kind of methodology that you will be doing one professional judgment with adequate reasoning and supporting data this technique requires high professional expertise and experience because someone would be able to judge on the basis of certain you know available information and that judgment definitely cannot be made by someone who has not you know done much work in this field so an experienced professional must be consulted if it is the case of professional judgment that you want to have it you can also go for experiments or tests but this can be expensive time taking so many a times on the basis of baseline information and expert consultation you can take a call in certain case past experience numerical calculation mathematical models which we discussed in great detail in previous lecture using those models also you can you know generate lot of data information suitability analysis physical and visual analysis you can do it using you know geographical information system we talked about that also geographical information system using of remote sensing technology these are the tool that today we have and we must utilize it to the maximum possible risk assessment and then finally economic valuation of the environmental impact this is the one exercise economic valuation is very very critical the impact 
of any kind of activity on environment, yes, we can understand that looking certain analysis, certain test. But how much actually value that we have lost because of that particular activity in monetary term is also equally important because that can give us some kind of you know understanding and a feeling that how much actually we are losing because of a certain activity. And if we had have carried out a good EIA, we can actually generate early warning and then that particular activity could have been stopped and then this loss could have been avoided. So, see the total scenario and that is why uh, I am giving lot of time and lot of lectures on EIA because this is really very, very important for all of us. Analysis of alternative. Now, if you uh, recall that in case of MCDA, we talked about choice of alternatives. Choice of alternatives is very, very important, but how do you do that? Analysis of alternatives is done to establish the preferred or most environmentally sound, financially feasible and benign option for achieving your project objective. Means which impact the environment less and achieve also the goal of the project and for that you need a very sound planning. World Bank directives sometimes requires systematic comparison you know of proposed investment design in terms of site, technology, processes etc. in terms of their impacts and feasibility of their mitigation, capital, recurrent cost, suitability under local condition and institutional, training and monitoring requirements. For each alternative, the environmental cost should be quantified to the extent possible and economic values attached wherever feasible and the basic for selected alternative must be stated for what region which alternative you have chosen. The analysis of alternative also includes no project alternative. When the project not being sanctioned, it is a better alternative than it is being sanctioned. Means if a project has some kind of negative impact that you find out that if it takes place it will have a negative impact. So, it is better to reject, better not to sanction. So, the no project alternative is better than to have that. Okay? Now, let us come to the sixth step that is mitigation and impact management. Now, we know that mitigation is often done to avoid, minimize or offset a predicted negative impact. And whenever it is appropriate, it is to incorporate this into an environmental management plan or system. And that is what actually often you will see that people go for EIA to understand that, to have a plan in system in place. For each potential adverse impact, the plan for its mitigation at each stage of the project should be documented and budgeted. Cost should be mentioned, how much actually is going to be required. So, the objectives of mitigation therefore, are to find better alternatives and ways of doing things. Second, enhance the environmental and social benefits of a project. Third, avoid, minimize or you know try to find out the remedy for the adverse impacts even if suppose it occurs for some reason. Finally, ensure that whatever remaining residual adverse impacts, they are kept within a acceptable limit or levels. Okay? Now, under mitigation and impact management, I will give mention about certain approaches with some examples. Now, avoidance approach means you want to avoid certain particular event or impact. Example, change of route or site details to avoid important ecological or archaeological features. Means, if you change the route or site details of the particular project, proposed project, probably you can avoid some impact on important ecological or archaeological features. So, that is avoid approach, replace which is relatively harder, replace, regenerate similar habitat of equivalent ecological value in different location. It is tough means, in one location you just cannot avoid, but you have to go for the project for the larger benefit of society. So, in that case replace approach means, you in another place try to regenerate 
a similar kind of habitat, similar kind of plantations, you know, water bodies, etc. And that is not easy. Reduce that is relatively easier. You use different kind of filters, precipitators in your industry or in your project. Suppose you are planned for a processing industry. Use those kind of things, noise barriers, dust enclosures, and that's the way you can actually reduce the impact. Restore size restoration after you construct suppose a project, you can go for size restoration. Again, I think this is doable. Compensate easiest, I think, option approach. Reallocation of displaced communities, facilities for the effective communities, financial compensation. My point is that, my suggestion would be, why to go at this place first? This should be our last thing. So, let us see that if we can somehow deal with these approaches and can address the situation so that we do not reach in compensation. Compensation means already the impact has taken place. Either you have pushed the people out of the place or suppose you have gone with the project and it has created an impact. So, the best would be that you try to find out a solution even before you go to the compensate. But if nothing can be done, then of course, you reach in this state this approach and there are many examples that are lying in front of your eyes. Then next environmental management plan EMP and environmental monitoring. EMP again in previous lectures I have discussed about environment management plan in great detail. So, I will just touch upon here environment management plan it includes you know different kind of action that are needed to implement different kind of measures which can actually reduce the impact of any activity on the environment. So, it could be mitigation based environmental impacts, you know, it could be also environment management plan can include monitoring objectives. So, that continuously you can monitor a particular, you know, projects and impact. And if you see that the monitoring part of EMP, it provides lot of information. Monitoring part, it gives, you know, description, technical details of the project what is happening actually over a period of time. This provides lot of data on various aspect and believe me, if proper monitoring has taken place that not only gives a way out for the existing project, but also it will give you an enormous amount of knowledge base, which you can utilize for any upcoming or future project in that locality or elsewhere. So, monitoring and reporting procedures are very important and they ensure the early detection of conditions, any conditions that may necessitate particular mitigation measures. So, a good monitoring is also important. Environmental management plan should also provide specific description of institutional arrangements. We talked in earlier lecture about that. It should also include an estimate of the cost and measures and activities recommended, how much money you need for that particular activity. It should also have compensatory measures if in case mitigation measures are not feasible or cost effective. EMP must be operative throughout the whole project as I said just few minutes back. It is a continuous process monitoring, good monitoring you know is key under environmental project you know management plan. Environmental monitoring should actually have different types of monitoring system. One is baseline monitoring, impact monitoring, compliance monitoring. Now, if you see that baseline monitoring, it is a survey, we discussed about baseline data collection also. It gives you the basic information about an area, its environmental condition and you know how that proposed site, if it comes in, how that could actually you know impact the local area, society. These all are basic baseline information and monitoring. Impact monitoring, if the project takes place, what kind of biophysical, socio-economical, you know, impact it will have. So, through impact monitoring, you can get to know those things. So, impact monitoring also involves lot of field studies, where you can actually test your soil, water, air, you can monitor them on regular basis. Compliance monitoring, this is actually a kind of a, you know, process where you time to time do sampling of a particular area as I said soil sampling, water or air sampling and try to see that whether you know that particular project is complying with the standards as set by 
you know a particular country or a standard that the country follows. Okay. So, specific environmental quality indicators or pollution levels also need to be you know monitor and measure just to ensure that the project is you know maintaining that kind of standard which is required the minimum standard on the basis of that particular country's environmental criteria, environmental standards or any international standard whichever. So, compliance with you know the existing standards is another important part of EMP and environmental monitoring. What to avoid in case of monitoring? We must be careful of overestimation because sometime you will find that sometime a report overestimates and project in such a way that a project if that particular project comes in it will be a doomed day everything will be finished. So, we also should be careful about overestimation equally underestimation underestimation of time cost impact on environment must be avoided weak coordination between data collection with project timetable and seasonal factors because sometime in some cases suppose rainy season a project is there which is affected by flood every rainy season now you cannot do you cannot carry out any kind of monitoring exercise but if you are in your timetable you mention the july august you are going to do the field monitoring certainly that will not be feasible so, you should have a coordination between your data collection with, with the timetable and along with the keeping the seasonal factors in, in mind. Ignoring the requirements for baselines. So, these are some of you know the things we sometimes do the mistake you know that we ignore you know the baseline survey we think that okay it is not required, but baseline survey as I said just couple of minutes back that gives you an idea clarity that how the particular location was before the project and then you do monitor because that will be your zero point right starting point and then if the project comes what could be the impact. So, if your baseline information is not sound and if you ignore that certainly your monitoring or planning will be wrong. Environmental impact statement EIS I mentioned it also earlier very very important when you go for EIA report EIS is an important part of that. What are the contents of EIS? Very, very important for a EIS statement, executive summary you should have. EIS should have a policy, legal and administrative framework, should have description of the environment of that area, local area where actually the project will take place, description of the proposed project in detail, significance of environment impacts, socio-economic analysis of project impact, identification and analysis of alternatives just now we discussed, mitigation action, mitigation management plan which we just discussed, finally environment management plan that we are discussing over last couple of minutes. Then monitoring program, knowledge gaps, public environment how public community is getting involved. Then you should have list of references and finally, you can have appendix with the difference you know secondary information, terms of reference and various other notes that you have referred while compiling the EIA report all right. So, this is important part decision making step 9 as every stage of EIA an interim decision is made and this decision influence your final decision made about the EIA means whether the project will be sanctioned or not. These interim decision which are being taken ultimately would affect your final decision. The EIS is submitted to the designated authority and they will have a scrutiny before the you know final decision. The authority together with the technical review committee will determine the quality of environment impact statement that is there in the EIA report and then they will give the public further opportunity to comment. So, the report will be kept shared in the public domain for certain period of time if anybody wish to comment on that. Based on the outcome of the review the designated authority finally, will accept reject or make further modification to avoid any future confrontation. If the EIS is accepted and EIA license will be issued additional studies or recommendation are made before issuance of license if your EIS is not accepted. 
if accepted license issued if not accepted then further studies should be carried out the decision making process should be autonomous so that the outcome of the review is seen as fair enough and unbiased that is important because in most of the cases there is complaint of biasness the final step effective eia follow up the environment management plan which submitted with the EIS report that you will submit should be used during implementation and operation of the project. Now, what is the link between the EIA process and the project implementation stage? You will find that in most of the cases, the link between the EIA process which is being carried out and the project implementations you know stage is very weak and especially in developing countries. And there may be various reasons for that. Some of them are deficiencies in environmental management plans prepared during the EIA, deficiencies in monitoring and enforcing the compliance, whichever has been established in particular country or location on the basis of legal instrument, financial instruments. So, monitoring is weak. Timing of some projects, especially in developing countries are implemented several years after the EIA has been carried out, EMP has been built. And in this kind of scenario, if you have 10 years of gap between the EIA report submitted and the project initiated, then you can understand within that 10 years, there must have been some change and natural process change in the, in the environment. So, you need again another interim EIA. You have to update that old EIA. So, Ideally, between EIA and project implementation, there should not be long gap. If for some reason there is a long gap, you must update that. Otherwise, what is the meaning? EIA also you have carried out, you spend so much of money and then you start the project after 10, 15 years, showing that old EIA report that my project has, you know, compliance certificate. What is the meaning? So, that need to be also taken care of. Overall, a regular follow-ups, checks-ups and mandatory, you know, kind of checking compliance, whether the compliance are meeting or not as per the EA guidelines. So, overall, a regular monitoring of the entire system is required for a successful EIA and so that a project also can be implemented without any kind of other issues or problems or confrontations. So, that is important. Thank you.